Welcome, everyone. My name is Denise Jorgens. I'm the Director of Programs and External Relations here at International House. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of International House. Tonight's program is um, uh, part of the World Beyond the Headlines series, which is a collaborative project of the Center for International Studies, the International House Global Voices Program, and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, as well as the Seminary Co-op Bookstores. Its aim is to bring scholars and journalists together to consider major international issues and how they are covered. Upcoming, um, another upcoming program in the International House Global Voices series, which I'd like to uh, draw your attention to, is a conference we are hosting on November 9th with the National Strategy Forum titled Asia Pacific Region Economic and Security Issues. Um, that's at 5 p.m. on November 9th. Um, and so thank you all for coming. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Irving Berkner, who will introduce tonight's program. Thank you. OK, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you again to this is our fourth World Beyond the Headlines program of the fall term. And um, before going any further, I want to uh, mention that this program is being recorded audio and video. Um, so if you want to hear it again, you'll be able to download it to your iPod and work out to it or whatever you like. Um, <laughs> as long as you have a good beat, it'll be fine. Um, so this program and other public programs that take place on campus and throughout the community um, are available on two different websites. One is our own, the Center for International Studies site. Um, it's uh, chiasmos at uchicago.edu, which I won't bother to spell. There's uh, flyers over there with the URL on it. You can grab it from there. We're also working in partnership with Chicago Public Radio, WBEZ, and uh, through a program called Chicago Amplified. And you can find their uh, archive at chicagopublicradio.org slash amplified. So tonight, we'll be hearing from Sally Hughes on her new book, Newsrooms in Conflict, Journalism and the Democratization of Mexico. Professor Hughes is an assistant professor in the School of Communication at the University of Miami, and her research focuses on the news media during processes of political change in Latin America, um, and she's particularly interested in understanding the relationship between journalists, the news, and the public sphere. She herself was a journalist in Mexico for many years and uh, was the recipient of the Goldsmith Research Award from the Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard University for the research that she used in publication of this book. Uh, tonight's moderator is Maurizio Tenorio, uh, who's actually brand new to our campus, a new professor of history and the acting director of the CAT Center for Mexican Studies, which is also one of the sponsors, along with the Center for Latin American Studies, um, of tonight's event. Uh, he comes to us from the University of Texas at Austin, where he was uh, from 1995 until this summer. Um, his most recent book is on Mexico at World's Fairs, Crafting a Modern Nation. And I'm very glad he could come here tonight to uh, moderate this event. Um, following Professor Hughes' presentation, Professor Tenorio will offer a few comments, and then we'll take comments or questions from the audience. Um, that should end around 7.15, 7.20, at which point um, we are selling copies of Professor Hughes' books in the back, and she'll be happy to stick around and sign a copy for you. So again, I want to thank the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, the I House, and the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, the Center for Latin American Studies, and the CAT Center for Mexican Studies for co-sponsoring this series and this event. So please join me in welcoming Sally Hughes. Thanks so much to the International Studies Center, to the International House, to the Mexican Center, to the bookstore uh, for inviting me to the University of Chicago. Am I going to mess up your audio if I walk around? I tend to do that. I'll try not to. Um, it's really nice to be in Chicago. Many of you probably know that Chicago is home to the second largest Mexican and Mex Mexican-American population in the United States. So I'm going to talk a lot about Mexico tonight. Um, but I'm also going to talk about a more universal question, which is how do we create and how do we sustain media that have a positive impact on civic participation, on citizenship. Um, so I wanted, because the book's about journalism, because my background's in journalism, and because I think it works, I want to start by telling you a story that illustrates what was going on in Mexico um, during the period I looked at, basically from the 1980s through uh, the 1990s. Um, both what was going on in a segment of the Mexican press um, and also the sort of potential it has for 
uh, democratization, at least electoral democratization. And the story is about a young woman who had uh, recently graduated from university in Guadalajara. Her name's Alejandra Shanik. And she um, graduated with a degree in anthropology and wasn't quite sure what she wanted to do with her life. And she heard about this new newspaper opening up called Siglo XXI. And it was going to be a different sort of newspaper. It was going to be critical. It wasn't going to be beholden to any particular power. And uh, it was going to practice a more fact-based form of, of journalism. Um, they recruited her in part because they wanted people who had not been trained as Mexican journalists, who had not been absorbed in the culture at that time, uh, the dominant culture, not the only culture, but the dominant culture of Mexican journalism. So she went to Siglo XXI and she began to, she was trained by uh, the author and journalist from Argentina, Tomas Eloy Martinez. Uh, her editor uh, had been a sociology professor who spent one year at El País in Madrid, and they gave her some training and threw her into the streets to be a reporter. Um, one afternoon, she was sent to cover a press conference. It was a press conference from city and state officials responding to worries that there were gas fumes all over central Guadalajara. And the press conference was to say that the gas fumes had been uh, dissipated and there wasn't a problem. But unlike most of the reporters there, uh, after listening to what the officials had to say, she actually went out to the underground ducts, the, the, the drainage system, where people were testing uh, the fumes, and she saw that they looked pretty worried. So she kept reporting. And the next morning, her newspaper, uh, that morning was April 22, 1992, ran a map of where these fumes were located and said that they had not been dispersed. The newspaper came out perhaps hours before 26 blocks of Guadalajara exploded. Um, the blast killed more than 200 people and it left 20,000 people homeless. And the explosion followed the very path that the map in the newspaper said it would. Siglo XXI kept reporting, um, including on the flimsy denial that these fumes came from a state-owned gas plant. And a few years later, the explosion, the de denial, became big issues in the governor's and mayor's race in the city of Guadalajara and the state of Jalisco. The PRI lost those races as part of mm, a series of losses at the state and local level. Uh, which they'd controlled for 71 years in Mexico. Over the next few years, more city governments and more state governments toppled, and the PRI lost what was the epicenter of its semi-authoritarian system, the president. Um, this is what happened in a portion of the Mexican press, and I want to tell that story, but it's also a cautionary tale because we're not sure whether this civic impulse will continue as Mexican democracy consolidates and also this form of journalism, which I call civic, was challenged by other forms, including a market-driven form of journalism and what I call adaptive authoritarianism. So that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. And this is just a rough outline of the talk. Um, I'd like to uh, go over how academics try to approach similar questions. This is a bit different from uh, much of the media studies literature done in the United States and Western Europe, this question. Um, I'd like to talk more specifically about the Mexican case and at least for a few minutes at the end put it in a more comparative Latin American uh, perspective. And then uh, if there's time in the questions and answers, um, we could talk about what happened in Mexico this summer uh, with the election, the post-electoral conflict, and at least my thoughts about how the media behaved, although I haven't done the sort of uh, rigorous uh, research that I did for this book. But if you're interested, we can, we can talk about that. Um, so when academics begin to study media systems and journalism, um, they do it from a variety of perspectives. One is the 
political economy perspective. On the one hand, the one that's argued most often in this country, uh, the free press paradigm uh, states that what you need to do is protect media from political control, and the best way to do that is to put the media in the private sector. However, the critical political economy school says, but what about the pressures of the market and of the economy? They come at it from that perspective. Um, comparatively, when, when you look around the world, you can see variations at the national level in how media behave. And way back in the 1940s, people began to compare systems in a typology um, the original typology was, well, there's democratic uh, media systems, there's uh, authoritarian media systems, at that point there were communist media systems, and there were media systems which were described as developmental, where the media was under control of the state but uh, purportedly used to develop the, con the country economically. These studies uh, in more recent iterations have tried to get at the variation that we see in democratic systems around the world, particularly focusing again on this question of the role of economic forces and also looking at whether they stimulate or not uh, civic participation. Um, I found those uh, studies to be interesting in the sense of using them as benchmarks or, or guideposts um, not so much to compare between systems, although that's what they were derived for, but to compare a system as it changed across time. And I think you'll see that um, in my work. And then uh, I also was reading uh, organizational studies. We got a flurry of those in the 1970s and 1980s. Researchers went into NBC, they went into CBS, they went into the New York Times, they went into local newspapers. They were trying to figure out why it is that news comes out as it does, and as, as all of these researchers were trying to figure out. And they came up with another, a number of explanations um, that reporters' relations with sources behaved in uh, a particular way, that reporters use certain routines to gather and to, to, um, to write the news. Um, and a few of them talked about the culture of the newsroom and the dominant values of the newsroom. In this case, uh, this was mostly U.S. studies, so the dominant values and culture of U.S. journalism. Um, and then finally, only a few years ago, we started to get more and I would say more sophisticated uh, analyses of what was happening with journalism in Latin America, and that was stimulated by events. Public opinion became more important as the authoritarian regimes in the region subsided. Uh, journalism uh, became more independent and assertive, um, um, at least in part. They were uh, given credit or blame for, for uh, preempting presidencies, both uh, constitutionally and extra-constitutionally. Um, so people began to, to look at that phenomenon more, and Dan Holland and his Greek colleague, whose name I won't try to produce, um, compared Southern Europe and countries in Latin America through a lens of clientelism. They wanted to explain the relationship of, of media and media owners in the state, and they looked at it that way. Um, Rick Rockwell and Noreen Janis were looking at some of the same questions in Central America, and instead of patron-client, they, they thought that these ties were more um, suitably described as, as, as a uh, cooperative ol oligarchy with overlapping um, political and economic and media elites um, involved in this exchange. Um, Sylvia Weisbord was interested in this phenomenon that I mentioned a minute ago of, of more assertive journalism in South America, which he calls watchdog journalism specifically. And he attributed the rise of that, since then it's been in decline, but he attributed the rise of that to liberalization, both political we had the retreat of uh, military governments, so the censors left the newsroom. The journalists weren't being exiled. They weren't being disappeared. So that extremely harsh environment in which really no one 
above ground, there were some underground journalists would, you know, challenge the regime in any way, um, had lifted. Um, the economic controls that many Latin American governments had through the control of, of advertising, um, through, you know, um, state-owned businesses from airlines to banks, um, became privatized and moved that resource um, from state control to um, the private sector. Um, all of that liberalized the environment of news production. At the same time, though, we weren't seeing exposés about everything. Uh, the only time we'd see exposés about um, big business is when it touched the government. Um, there was certain patterns to who was getting uh, exposed and who was not, and he attributed that to uh, owners' particular political and commercial interests and a culture in South American journalism of looking toward the state, both as sources and as a source of prestige should you decide to be a muckraker. That's a U.S. term, but I think you know what I mean. Um, so he, he, he took what was going on in the environment, uh, owner's particular interests, and certain aspects of journalistic culture in South America, and he said that's why we have the rise of watchdog journalism. Um, similarly, uh, Chapel Lawson looked at what he called media opening in Mexico. He doesn't clearly define that, but, but he's talking about some of the same things that, that I observed, which was a more critical, a more independent portion of the media. Um, and he, he largely attributed that to, to competition in television. Um, also talked a bit about journalists' norms of appropriateness and how that changed. But mostly he was, he was looking at competition as a uh, strong explanation for why journalism changed in Mexico. Um, I haven't used these before. There we go. So. This was all well and good, but I didn't think that it tied together uh, the different possible explanations and also what I was seeing in the, on the ground. And it was really, it's nice that the area in international studies people are here because what really gave me, I think, the literature and the theory that goes the farthest to explain what happened in Mexico um, was interaction with some sociologists when I was at UC uh, University of California, San Diego, in the Mexico Center, you know, and, and talking to them about what I was seeing in my field work, they said, well, you really should look at the literature on organizations and institutions from sociology. Um, so I did that, and it made a lot of sense to me. Um, let me just explain what the literature says. Um, first of all, when we're talking about institutions, we mean widely shared values, behaviors, and ways of viewing the world that endure across time. Okay? Sometimes these can manifest themselves within organizations. For example, newsrooms, or art museums, or hospitals, or state legislatures. Um, and if they are the type of organization uh, that has many similar, um, not parts, but similar other organizations are similar, like all the things I just mentioned, um, we can get a institution that transcends one organization and becomes a trans-organizational institution. Um, in other words, for example, Cook, talking about the U.S. media, argued that the media in the United States is a trans-organizational institution because the people who populate these organizations share the same values, way of looking at the world, and way of behaving. That seemed to make a lot of sense to me. And um, from that then, again, in interaction with my field work in Mexico, um, and what I was reading in terms of theory from media studies and elsewhere, um, I proposed uh, a model of news media uh, transformation um, in which I argued that it was really four different domains or levels of institutional action that explained what happened. 
Um, in the Mexican case, there was an environmental opening, an opening in the uh, environment for news production. It entailed uh, democratization, in this case electoral democratization, as state and local governments moved uh, away from the 71-year-old ruling party. They took patronage with them. They also signified that they had supporters. Um, economic liberalization, which was part of the neoliberal plan that led to NAFTA, in part, uh, meant that the Mexican government sold off airlines, re privatized banks, deregulated telephones, uh, telephone service, and you'll see later in the presentation, uh, based on that, the private sector advertising took off. So where in the late 70s, I had estimates of the government controlling 80% of newspaper advertising, by the mid to late 90s, uh, it probably controlled, actually I have data from the newspapers, um, the big, biggest newspapers said five to six percent of their um, of their advertising came from the government. So there was this big shift in the incentives of uh, news production um, that also coincided with a rise in civic partic participation generally in Mexico. But if if that were the only answer, then we have to ask, you know, why didn't all newspapers change? Many resisted change. And other media outs, outlets, as I'm going to argue in a few minutes, changed in a very different way. They responded much more to the commercial cues than to what was happening in civil society. So, um, at the, on the one hand, so so the econo the uh, environmental political economy approach doesn't um, doesn't explain what was happening fully. Um, at the level of a field of similar, similarly behaving institutions, what I found was that early in the transition, some newspapers changed. They became more critical, became more assertive, they became more plural, and they changed the reference for news production, both because they became financially successful, but also because they became um, the sources of prestige, both internationally and and domestically. So they changed these innovative uh, organizations within the institutional field uh, became new points of reference. And from them, in a variety of ways, ideas, values, and practices diffused to a wider number of newspapers. Finally, well not finally, a third level would be the newsroom. All of these things I've been talking to you about, including the last, which was the social psychological world of the journalist, came together in the newsroom. It really became a crucible uh, for all of the things going on and for um, what in most cases was a purposeful uh, attempt to retool culture. Sometimes it was just incremental, but in many of the uh, newsrooms I went into, they purposefully sought to change values behaviors and ways of looking at the world. And all of that happened within this organizational setting of the newsroom. And then finally, the social psychological world of the journalist. I put it last here, but in some ways it should be first. Because especially for these, uh, what I call early innovators, the, the newspapers that first began to change, um, it seems to me that the drive came from uh, mostly owners, publishers, top editors, people who had uh, resources in the newsroom uh, to change their newsrooms and they needed space in the environment but their uh, drive seemed to be more value oriented um, in the early phase of change. Later when we get the private sector having more power, the political opposition controlling more resources, then maybe it's more of an interaction but the early change came from people who were driven to change. So this is at the newsroom level, my explanation for what created, uh, in this case, a civic-oriented newsroom. You have a journalist, and in most cases they were the publisher or a top editor. In a few cases they weren't, but usually they were, who had oppositional values, alternative ideas about journalism society, and 
organizational power, power in their newsroom. That's why I say in most cases it was the owner or a top editor. I know plenty of people personally who had these two, but they didn't have that. So what did they do? Well, one became a physicist. Uh, others went to work for culture sections where they could write criticism in a very high level for people who already knew it. Um, a lot of people became disgruntled. So if you didn't have a certain decision-making power in your newsroom, a lot of these people left. Um, and then this rather convoluted <laughs> chart is the different levels of institutional interaction. And I won't go into it in too much detail. You can read it in the book. I've given it to you most already. The, the news production environment, which was opening during the 20 years or so that I was looking at what was going on in the press. The individual's mental models and professional identities and how that interacted at the newsroom level and also at the level of the wider uh, newsroom institution. And if you follow this, you'll see that I'm arguing that what was once a consolidated institution of shared values and behaviors, with some exceptions always, but largely a, 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 an institutionalized press system, um, is now a hybrid system where dominant values and behaviors by newsroom might be described as more civic, more market-driven, or more um, authoritarian either either in a sort of frozen capacity or what we're seeing around the country is an ad adaptation to newsrooms responding to local elites. Um, the two questions that guided my research, which led me to propose this model, were first, what happened in the Mexican media during this period of, of pretty profound political and economic change? What happened? And the second question was then, how did it happen? Um, to get at the first question of what happened, I, um, I conducted a, a content analysis both on the eve of the 2000 election when the pre lost power after 71 years and across time, across this period of political and economic liberalization. And um, to do that then, I, need to, I needed to operationalize these concepts of different models of journalism, civic journalism, market-driven, authoritarian. Um, and the first two were far easier to operationalize. Um, by civic journalism, which I mean a journalism that, that enables uh, civic participation, it would be diverse in its views of the regime. It would pre present diverse perspectives on the views of, regime, of the regime. And in my sample of newspapers, I had both newspapers that came from the left and came from the right. But prior to the pre-losing power, there was this, this other line that, that, that divided Mexican society other than ideology, and that was whether you were for or against the continuation of the pre-system. So diversity in their views of the continuation of the regime, not so much ideological, although they're probably related. Um, assertiveness in reporting, it was pretty easy to operationalize. It was, um, were they stenographically uh, transcribing press releases or were they talking to other people? Were they, were they taking news as it was fed to them or were they generating it themselves? And then autonomy, were they acting in an autonomous fashion? Authoritarian would be the opposite. Uh, not diverse, a monologue, um, not assertive, passive, and not autonomous. Market-driven journalism gets more problematic because it is diverse when media audiences are diverse and demand it and when advertisers will um, allow it. It's, the same can be said for assertiveness. And in terms of autonomy, you could argue it would be autonomous from the state but not from uh, economic power. Um, although there are cases still in Mexico where the state is controlling, say, um, mm, legal resources um, such as new concessions or 
uh, and the like, where you could say, well, they're not autonomous in that regard either. So um, certainly more autonomous than under the authoritarian regime, but not completely autonomous from the state. Um, the Mexican media institution lasted from about the early 40s to the early 1980s for 40 years. And as I said, there were always a few organizations that would buck the trend, but essentially it was in its own way uh, similar to what the literature describes as an authoritarian system. Um, it became an institution of shared values, behaviors, and ways of viewing the world. Just, it's hard for me to read that screen and I don't want to get ahead. There we go. Um, and it replicated or was stabilized by a, no, a number of mechanisms. Um, appropriateness, we should remember that the PRI was a fairly legitimate system for many decades, especially when you compared it to dictatorships in South America, when you thought about the advance of the urban middle sectors. Um, until the 1980s when economic declines happened, it had a, a large amount of support. Um, so the appropriateness of being part of that system um, was one explanation for why this institution um, um, remained stable. Orthodoxy, it was just how things were done. Our job is to support the state, to report passively about the president, to support his, um, um, his um, plans and proposals, his image. Um, and then, especially later, as the system began to lose its legitimacy, um, more and more instrumentalism is, um, took place. I mean, it, it, it explains more and more of why this institution persisted. And that would be subsidies, subsidies for, for ink, for importing um, printing presses, um, government uh, advertising contracts. It had nothing to do with the audience you were trying to reach, just to support the newspaper. Um, direct payments reporters would receive um, beyond the payroll of the, of the state agencies they covered. Indirect payments under the table to media owners and reporters. Um, and then for broadcasting, the big one for the television, the sole television network from the 50s to 1993 was protection from competition as well as uh, concessions for frequencies, both for radio and TV. Um, and then finally, you know, like if you study Mexico, they talk about me the pre having a bigger carrot than, than, than stick. I mean, it, it was a used co-optation much more than violence, although there are certainly cases of that. There was state intervention in a number of cases across the years, and I talk about those. Um, but because of these internal agreements, because of system legitimacy, um, that, that wasn't the main explanation. Even though a lot of people looking at the Mexican press at this time talk about the bribery, that was only one, uh, one part of the explanation. And it re really became more, um, more important as an explanation as the system lost legitimacy. So if you just take a second and read this quote, it's from the... Uh, editorial vice president of the largest newspaper in Mexico, and he began uh, as a reporter in that newsroom in the 70s. Um, I think you can see how this was what a sociologist might call an overdetermined institution. It was appropriate, it was orthodox, and, and the instrumental um, uh, cues were there as well. So reporting passively about the government um, um, not critically, not diverse. Um, I get into how that manifested itself directly in the news. Um, but it was an institution that I say lasted for about 40 years. Um, so then the question is, what happened in the 1980s and 1990s to change that? And I've given you my model. I, I want to tell you how I got there. Um, I took content and I took uh, a sample of coverage both in 2000 and from 1980 
uh, in five-year increments to 2000, and I measured it uh, on this civic and authoritarian scale on these measures of diversity, autonomy, and assertiveness. And what I saw was, in terms of coverage about the government, about partisan politics, about electoral politics, um, newspapers in general became much more assertive, but there was a wide range in, um, in how much. Um, you'll see that in a minute. What I didn't, where you don't see as much change is outside of that sort of formal arena of politics. When we're talking about cultural institutions such as the church or economic power, um, I actually think since 2000 when I did this um, study, I've seen more criticism of the church, some timid criticism of economic power, not that much. Um, so the change was, went the furthest in the electoral arena and less in, when we were dealing with economic power and um, cultural power. The four newspapers I analyzed was Excelsior, which by reputation in the late 1990s was sort of a pro prototypical um, authoritarian newspaper. Um, it was passive. A lot of the reporting was based on stenography of press releases. Um, it, it was, um, there were stories that there were under the table payments to some of the main columnists. Um, but mostly it was clear in the lack of diversity in coverage. And this is a front page um, about a few days before the 2000 election when the conservative party, PAN, won the presidency and ended the pre-system after 71 years. And they've dedicated their entire front page to coverage of, of the pre-candidate. And actually as the election got closer, this was more typical of the um, type of coverage we'd see. Um, the second newspaper I chose, well, first of all, I chose these, these newspapers because they represented the range of uh, journalism that was present in, Me in the Mexican press um, at the time in 2000. They also were the market leaders, so those were the two criteria. Excelsior would be one bookend. El Universal was in transition when I did my field work there, um, my main field work there. And that was very useful for me because when I talk about this purposeful cultural retooling, I actually got to see it happening. Um, so I would say from about 1995 to 2000, uh, one burst in 95 and again in 99 and 2000, they went, underwent this transformation of, of the way they reported the news, the way they um, um, visualized who they were reporting for. Um, and by, by 2002, then, the lead story is about human rights abuses. Um, and there's probably better examples than this one about the type of reporting they're doing today. Um, then we have two civic newspapers by reputation uh, on the left and on the right. Reforma. <laughs> Uh, is the sister newspaper of a founding civic newspaper in Mexico called El Norte, which is on the border with the United States. Um, when it opened in Mexico City in 1994, it created shockwaves through the journalism uh, community because the reporters were paid well, <laughs> the advertisement was sold by professional advertising staff, um, and this is their first uh, this is their first edition, and you can see they've led with the opposition candidates um, taking off in their presidential campaign. Down below, they still have the president, though. Um, and then La Jornada, which has a long tradition in Mexico, both as La Jornada and uh, in previous publications, um, is, comes more from a leftist perspective. But again, be, before the pre-lost power, the cleavage that was perhaps most important was whether the pre would stay in or not. And this is the day that Vicente Fox of the Conservative Party, PAN, uh, became president. And I think it's kind of funny. They don't say the right one. They say the pre-lost. Um, So I performed 
you know, a number of measures on these newspapers in 2000 on the eve of this, uh, we can argue about it later, regime shifting uh, election in Mexico. And um, you can see there, there's, a there's variation in where the newspapers are, are falling, but essentially Reforma and La Jornada are, are more on this uh, assertive, independent, um, diverse um, end of the scale. And Excelsior is, is very much lagging. Now, I've, I've said that most of the um, coverage change was limited to the political field rather than cultural and economic uh, power, but it's important to show how you know, much change did happen. This is the volume of presidential coverage as a percentage of all political coverage. So in some ways, it's a proxy for uh, diversity, for the number of voices that are appearing in political coverage. And you can see how it declined over time in all of the newspapers, and yet um, Excelsior still lagged behind in, uh, in most of, I think, in every year. Um, so why did some newspapers change more than others? And later, when we look at television, we'll say, why did the press, a portion of the press, uh, change um, before television did? And to answer that question, I didn't think I could get at that through a content analysis. So I did basically ethnographies of organizations. Um, the four main ones were Reforma, um, El Universal, uh, El Sur in Acapulco, and Frontera in Tijuana. But I have uh, either survey or interview uh, data or, inf or information from, from all of these newspapers. These are all newspapers that are more on the more independent side of the scale. Some of them very much you could put in the civic category, others um, just regionally. Um, um, tending toward that direction. And I won't go through, you know, every piece of information again, but from the survey data and from the in-depth interviews, um, I pieced together this model. Um, I'll just share a few quotes with you. For example, when we're talking about the um, environment, the larger news production environment. We had not only political and economic liberalization, but the shocks that caused in the system. Um, two of those shocks were the uh, Chiapas uprising, the indigenous uprising in Chiapas, and another was uh, the Colosio assassination, the assassination of the pre's presidential candidate, and the bank bailout program known as Foba Proa, uh, which cost six billion dollars and uh, under which there's a lot of questions about whether that went to the average debtor, the banks, or big business. And all the journalists who covered this, of course, had feelings about it and felt quite moved by what they were seeing and, and felt that to support a system that was becoming delegitimate um, was not what they wanted to do. So these shocks were part of what was going on, how the environment interacted with the journalist's own professional identity. Um, when I talk about the institutional field of organizations and say that ideas diffused, uh, there were a couple of ways that happened. Um, for example, um, the original um, newspapers trained journalists who, in this new style of journalism, who then went to work elsewhere and trained the journalists under them to think and behave the same way. In some cases, it was purposeful. In the case of, of this editor here, it was more an absorption of what he was learning from his bosses at El Financiero. Basically, it was a culture there that I progressively assimilated by learning and listening. On the more purposeful side, newspapers like Reforma came in and part, made it part of their identity explicitly that they were going to practice a different form of journalism. And by being part of this mission, really, um, um, energized their reporters to take on that 
mission as well. So one reporter tells me I committed myself to the Reforma project. I was Reforma. Um, I just wanted to mention, I, I haven't talked too much about where the change agents um, got these alternative ideas about journalism. Um, in the North, what I found was there was a general opposition to the continuation of, of the pre system because of their economic, uh, free market economic views, which at that time conflicted with those of the pre, because of some of their Catholic religious values, which at that time um, um, conflicted with those of the pre. And they got ideas about journalism both by watching uh, US media and by being trained in the United States. Um, I'm trying to think who was trained at Northwestern. Somebody was. Um, at the University of Texas, the most famous case is the owner of El Norte in Monterrey, who trained, who did his journalism training at the University of Texas and then brought his professors down and opened a, a summer institute to train his people that way. But it's not only coming from the United States. As I mentioned uh, when I opened the talk, um, there was a lot of influence from El País in Madrid. There were exiled journalists from South America who were working in, in Mexican newsrooms. And there were academics and people from other fields. The editors at El Financiero were, were trained as economists. So they brought a diff very different concept of, of what information should be to their jobs. Um, so I just wanted to mention that the, um, um, the change agents uh, varied in the reasons for their opposition. On the La Jornada, it was more from the left, but the ideas filtered both across geographic borders and disciplinary borders. Um, to get more um, closely at explanations, to get closer to, to the explanations for, again, why some organizations changed and why some didn't, I directly compared two very similar newspapers. They were similar in that at the beginning of the 90s, they were number one and number two in terms of circulation in the Mexico City market. So if one of the answers is, well, you have to have the financial uh, wherewithal to be independent, these both have them. So we're controlling for that. Um, the other explanation that's been offered is new competition. Well, they both faced new uh, form of competition, especially from Reforma by 1994. Reforma came in and appealed to the wealthiest uh, Mexicans and got the highest paying advertising advertisement. So over the years, there have always been new newspapers in Mexico City, but not one that took uh, your financial or had the potential to take your financial base. Um, in both, you basically had a frozen uh, administration. Um, in uh, Excelsior, the director of the paper had been there since 1976. In uh, Excelsior is a cooperative, but it's basically run hierarchically. So what matters? So what happens at the top matters. Um, El Universal is privately owned, and that owner had been there since 1969. So these are people that both formed under the old system and had run their newspapers hierarchically since then. So what happened? When these systemic shocks that I mentioned, the Zapatista uprising, the, uh, the assassination of the uh, pre-candidate, the, uh, the devaluation of 1994, the biggest since the Great Depression, um, the ensuing probable corruption after it was over. All of these shocks affected the people at Excelsior or the leaders of Excelsior, but in a more diffuse way. Um, the owner of El Universal, when I interviewed him, described his relationship with the assassinated presidential candidate as we called each other's brothers. When he saw the widow uh, soon after the association, the assassination, she told him, they did this to us. He felt it, and he says he felt it, very personally. And after it happened, uh, supposedly and to this day officially by a lone go gunman, he assigned a team of reporters to investigate it. Um, at the same time, 
um, he chose a reformist activist editor over another more status quo candidate to run his newspapers. Um, this turned out to be an important decision. Uh, this man took him to meet um, Catherine Graham of the Washington Post, the can't remember which Schulzberger of the New York Times, uh, got him more involved with the Inter-American Press Association. Um, at about that time, he was investigated for alleged tax fraud. They charged him 99 times, and they had auditors outside his office uh, for six months. Uh, in the end, three charges were sustained, and he paid a $3,000 fine. But during all this, he felt very personally his break with the regime. And he also was exposed to new ideas and to uh, new source, new reference, new sources of prestige. So based on this, I think there's more evidence that what matters is the change in the mental models of the people on top and the incentives in conjunction with the incentives in the, um, in the environment. Um, so let's turn to market-driven journalism. I'll go probably for another 15 minutes. Um, I thought I got a pretty good handle on what was happening in the Mexican press, but it didn't explain a lot of what I was seeing on Mexican television both the timing of the change and the particular characteristics of the change that we were seeing. Um, so again, uh, in interaction with literature um, and field work, I proposed a model of what I call market-driven journalism. Journalism where advertisers' needs and ratings determine content where media audiences are treated as consumers more than citizens. And it became noticeable in Mexican television, uh, especially in 1997. This may in part be because that's when we get really good content analysis studies, but I think it's a pretty good uh, marking of, of when we start seeing this, this form of journalism in earnest on Mexican television. Um, what are the effects for it? We might think, that they would all be, um, it would all be negative, they would have negative implications for what happened um, in Mexican uh, politics over the next few years. Um, in fact, it had two very different um, um, implications for democratization in Mexico. On the one hand, if your audience is politically plural and you're responding to the market, then you will diversify your political content. So if in 1998 the opposition only got on Televisa when they were compared to Mussolini or their brothers were shown to be illegitimate, allegedly, um, in 1997 during the congressional races and Mexico City mayor's race, they were on there the same amount of time and in a fairly accurate and non-biased way. Um, but there was another tendency, another trend in political and overall coverage, which is basically tabloidization. Um, um, it increased politics of conflict, politics as personality, and it changed the agenda of the news, um, the news programs, which in many modern democracies is considered the public's agenda. So, on the one hand, if you look at that chart, if you can understand that chart, you have uh, the percentage of the vote going to the opposition across four presidential elections and the percentage of coverage of the opposition across four presidential elections. So you can see how in 2000 they're essentially even. The political coverage becomes more diversified. But one of the problems with tabloidization of the news is that it changes the uh, agenda of what's covered, of what's out there, of what's, what's you know, public knowledge and under discussion. Um, and you can see across time how coverage of politics in the two mainstream large newscasts um, declined, uh, seriously declined. And at the same time, crime 
increased. Crime's a serious public issue in, in Mexico, um, but there was no contextualization. Um, they were focused on individual cases where people were presented as victims. Um, and it, it didn't offer people the sort of contextual knowledge um, that they need to deliberate um, about what's causing this problem, what might we do with it. In terms of health, that wasn't health care, that was personal tragedies caused by health problems. Um, so some of the explanations for market-driven journalism, hence the model, are similar to um, those for the rise of what I called civic-focused journalism. On the one hand, we have the rise of private sector advertising, which increased the importance of ratings. And here you can see across time how private sector advertising takes, takes off. If I could have gotten it, which I couldn't, um, you'd see that the amount of government advertising shrunk um, during this time. Um, so it wasn't only that the private sector became more important, the uh, government advertising declined. Um, you have the rise of the opposition at the local level, um, and importantly, you have the beginning of public financing of all campaigns, not just under the table for the ruling party, but open public financing um, to all parties. Um, most of that was spent on political advertisement. It's become a big issue in Mexico because of how expensive the elections are. But the rationale was if we can't get on the news, at least we can buy the time. And at that point, the opposition had enough political power to push through that reform. This is the number of state governorships uh, controlled by the PRI in red over time versus the opposition. So you can see how there's this gradual decline in, um, in the control of state-level patronage. And it also signaled to people how people's political attitudes and, and partisanship was much more diverse than what we were seeing on television. Um, that's fine, but that's not enough. At the same time, Televisa for the first time got competition. As part of this neoliberal program um, of privatization, um, the government sold off its network of educational television stations to um, a businessman who actually was connected to the president's brother through some investments. Nevertheless, um, TV Azteca, uh, the second national network in Mexico, was born during this period. And some analysts have described uh, the Televisa versus TV Azteca political coverage, political coverage as Coke versus Pepsi. There wasn't much difference in the substance, but there was a difference in the style. Um, it was, TV Azteca was younger. It was flashier. The segments moved faster. It was much more visual. Um, they pioneered the switch to the more tabloid topics in the news. So if it was Coke versus Pepsi, it still was a different style of journalism that appealed to a lot of people who for many years had only had what some people call the Walter Cronkite of Mexico. He really wasn't. He was the same anchor for 26 years on Televisa's main newscast. So they, were, they did have to face competition if the political co coverage wasn't that different. Um, all of this being true, we would imagine that change would have happened prior to 1997. Um, but let me show you two things. Um, these are uh, opinion polls across time during the election of 1997. This is what the uh, Televisa executives were seeing as their newscasts essentially downplayed the opposition. If you look in April, uh, the opposition candidate who is, um, the diamond, the leftist candidate. This is the Mexico City mayor's race. Uh, by May, he was the clear winner. They're watching these polls. They're on the front page of the newspaper Reforma, a civic-oriented newspaper. What happened in March? The longtime owner of Televisa, uh, named Emilio Escarga, 
uh, Milmo, died. He died of cancer in Miami on his yacht. Um, and his son took over. Uh, Emilio Escariga Sr. was famous for a statement describing his relationship with the government as, I'm a soldier of the pre. His son described himself famously as, I'm a businessman. And when he took over and saw those polls and saw how his newscast was declining, he changed things in a much more market-oriented direction. And he, his famous quote is, democracy is a great client. So what happens in the organizational leadership matters. And their values and views of what news is for matters as well. So if we want to talk about the different trajectories um, of what happened in the Mexican media, and we want to talk about the different timing, we need to take into all of these different um, levels of interaction. Um, after I did this, I thought it would be very useful to take this model comparatively, um, both to see if it was useful in other contexts and also get some ideas about what might happen next in Mexico. Again, this is a society in transition. So I picked similar cases uh, in the sense that in each of these countries during their transition uh, away from authoritarian rule, there were newspapers considered cutting edge that were more critical, that at least expre expressed plurality um, and really caused a uh, wave of change throughout the newspapers and their countries. Um, the first case I looked at was Chile's La Epoca. Uh, this opened as the Pinochet regime waned. Uh, it became a focal point for the no campaign, meaning the no re-election or no let's end the, the Pinochet regime. Um, it lost, however, its critical edge after Pinochet left power and the Christian Democrats took power, in part because its leaders sympathized with the project. Um, it was also hurt by the Christian Democrats' advertising policy um, and because of Chilean society's disinterest um, after the transition. Um, sorry. Argentina's Pagina 12 was another case. This was the um, muckraking newspaper that uh, pioneered the exposés around the minimum government. Um, it became the pioneer of watchdog journalism in Argentina. Uh, its top uh, reporters and columnists lost their critical edge when the current president came to power and, es and espoused a similar progressive ideology. And they state that openly. We're in agreement with most of what he does. Um, in Guatemala, we have a similar situation, but from the opposite ideology. Um, Siglo XXI in Guatemala w withstood uh, the self-coup attempt of, the Guata of a Guatemalan president. Um, they faxed out their editions as they were encircled by the army, um, getting out the word that um, the president's attempt to close Congress and the judiciary was not fully agreed to by all of the army. And, and Guatemala's young, fragile democracy withstood that. Um, and some credit uh, newspapers such as Siglo XXI to, to the resistance that slowly arose to that attempt. However, the owners of Siglo XXI were very pro-business. So when a pro-business uh, president came to power, they entered into a conflict with their reformist, civic-oriented, muckraking editor, um, and he left. He formed a new publication, El Periódico, but it's a much more modest enterprise, um, chiefly because of financial resources, although for a time they were heavily uh, repressed, including a home invasion um, of his property when he and his family were there. So it's not, in all of these cases, I think the common denominator was when a um, government came to power uh, that um, the main editors of these newspapers were agreement with. They lost their critical edge, and in some ways they lost uh, their relevance in society. And yet, in each of these cases, they left, they changed newspapers um, in their countries. They made them more assertive, um, more critical, 
Um, and so we can't say that just because they themselves lost a critical edge, there's no legacy there. And just finally, summing up, um, I wanted to um, sum up the lessons, I think, from the comparison. Um, how does civic journalism survive? How might it uh, be more than just a marginal or um, momentary um, form of journalism during these political transitions. Um, the environment has to remain open, maybe just enough. Even with Argentina's severe economic crisis, some newspapers continue to be critical, although much less. Um, the El Periódico case is you know, very instructive. The amount of repression they faced and they continued to be critical uh, assertive journalists was pretty impressive. Things have gotten better there, I understand, with a new president. Um, the professional identities of the journalists who run these newsrooms um, is critically important, um, as is maintaining their autonomy to make decisions on the public interest. And then finally, civil society needs to support these efforts. If you go back to the case of La Epoca in Chile, I was told that they would continue to publish exposés on human rights abuses, and when they put them on the front page after Pinochet lost power, their circulation would go down that day. So I'll leave you with a quote from a Chilean journalist who um, lived through that era. And I'll just be quiet while you read it. So we'll see what happens in Mexico. I would say in each of these countries there was a flourish of civic participation and more critical journalism. And we'll see what can be um, reestablished in each. Okay, so th I'll stop there. I've talked far too long. <laughs> um, thank you very much to Professor Hughes for very interesting paper. Um, in order for you to have the voice, because we don't have that much time left, I'm just going to say that uh, not knowing much of uh, being uh, what uh, an old professor of mine used to say, I am a dog from another barrio, I am not very knowledgeable in the theories and arts that Professor Hughes seems to be very knowledgeable about. I'm only going to say that uh, um, the panorama of uh, media in Mexico since the 1880s and 90s has changed uh, the, 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 the country very drastically. But I will leave you with a very pessimistic note uh, from my perspective. I think that um, what Professor Hughes calls civic uh, journalism or civic media uh, first of all, it's not that civic, and second, second of all, it's not that important. Uh, uh, what um, we should ha have in mind is that nobody really reads newspapers in Mexico. The most, uh, the paper, the newspapers who have uh, real circulation and sport papers, and even those are not as uh, the circulation that, for instance, El País has in 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 the Spanish language. Uh, and my pessimism is not because they are not important, is that despite all the changes that Professor Hughes has uh, pointed out, and I think they are very important, it still it was easier for Mexico, I should conclude as a historian, to reach freedom of speech than to reach professional journalists. We have a uh, vast f freedom of speech, people can say whatever they want. Um, but the institutions are not there either to guarantee um, that uh, to have a responsible journalist saying responsible things or for uh, uh, powerful people not to affect the interests of media and journalists. And I will leave you to an example which directly affects my guild, my profession as a historian and as a writer in Spanish and English. 
despite all the changes, we have these wonderful newspapers now. Uh, I must say that Excelsior has, in the last uh, two years, moved to our uh, very is now a very independent newspaper, of course, with a lot of money behind because a very powerful man bought it and he's putting a lot of money to pay it into a making a diverse plural newspaper. Lots of new journalists and writers are writing there. Um, but that's no surprise. La Jornada itself, being the leftist newspaper, has great support from uh, lots of important money people. Uh, but that's the case in the US, so we shouldn't be scared about it. It's just the name of the game. But to give you an example, um, the process of transition in, the, in Spain brought about the formation of one very important newspaper, El País, and the transformation of two very old, very old newspapers, eh, ABC and La Vanguardia in Barcelona. As a result, you have very professional journalism in Spain, competition with ideological positions, but very, very professional. You can agree or disagree, but it's well done. The problem in Mexico is that out of the transition to democracy, we came with a very, very important newspaper, El Reforma, coming from El Norte, La Jornada, and the transformation of Excelsior and El Universal. These are not very good papers. Just Plainly put, there is no research, and I will give you this example which leads to my own personal experience. There is almost no one doing investigative uh, in investigation, research, journalists doing any research. Still, uh, most of the newspapers who are good, or what Professor Hughes calls civic, is because they have opinion makers who write pieces. And this task is left to people like me. Imagine how bad is the situation. People like me are the owners of, are, are fulfilling the role that journalists in the New Yorker or journalists in the, in, in, in the New York Times or in the Washington Post do, which is, you know, they investigate, they spend three or four months in order to get to a news and get uh, this breaking news and do this. Nobody does that in Mexico. What we have is opinionitis. People have an opinion, and important people, that is. So Lorenzo Meyer has an opinion. So uh, Silva Herzog Marquez has an opinion. And everybody's fighting for the opinion of who is important. But of course, we don't do any research. We just write beautiful. And that's all we do. And now the opinion makers are making it into the TV. Every TV company has their talking heads who talk beautifully. Maybe with some gossips that they get from the corridors. Maybe because they read books. But those are our substitute for, investig for, for real research journalism. And it's not changing, and it's not changing, and I, I'm not optimistic that it's in transition because we historians know that we call transition any process, any moment, we don't know what actually happened or it's going to happen. It's not in transition, I think it's like that, and it will work as well, it works, and it works because economically it's very profitable for many people now to write in newspapers. A lot of people leave our newspaper in the era that Professor Hughes was talking about in the pre-times. Yes, they were paid, the journalists were in the payroll, the owner got money, but not a lot, you know, the writers, the editorial writers, the opera pieces were not really paid. Now you have lots of intellectuals, lots of media people making a lot of money from this. And people are happy in the way it is. Why train real journalists if you have Jesus Silva Herzog Marquez, Lorenzo Meyer uh, doing the job? Or maybe not, maybe it's a matter of generational change and it will uh, change. But my optimism, although very strong 10 years ago when all this started, it declines by the second every time I open a Mexican newspaper.